Great, well thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, as usual it's a great pleasure to speak at Marxism. So I'm going to talk today about Marxism and science from 1917 to 2017. That's quite a broad range, isn't it really? I was actually originally asked to do an article for the ISJ about science and the Russian Revolution. And it kind of morphed into more looking at, well not just what happened during the revolution, but also what happened to the left and science after that. So I also looked at the British... Um, left, scientific left in the 1930s and 40s and also the um, uh, experience of the 1960s and 70s in, in, in America. Uh, and I want to really look at how all these things are connected but essentially I want to look at the Russian Revolution as a high point of, of, of when a, you know, the working class gained power in a country, uh, when Marxism is, is you know, basically the ideology of a society, how, how that affected science. And then also look at the way that Stalinism uh, then led to the degeneration, not just to the revolution, but to some of those great scientific ideas that came out of the revolution. Um, so I think the first place to start really is by just saying that, you know, well actually I think science matters to socialists. I mean, maybe it's obvious everybody in the room, maybe it's not. I think it's a key thing that we should be interested in science. Uh, and to some extent, sometimes it's, it's still quite a marginal area within, within, um, the, within the left, really. Um, but, but really, if you think about some of the key problems of today, global warming, uh, are robots going to take our jobs, uh, new ways of killing people, whether it's lasers or invisible, the invisibility clocks or the rest of it, and also big issues that are coming out of genetics. We can now edit the human genome as, as, as well as read it. Where is that leading us? Is it going to be useful? Or is it going to raise all sorts of major problems for society? So that's why I think science matters to socialists. But I think it's also true to say that socialists have something to offer science. And the reason is that I think you can say that um, Marxism is the kind of high point of materialism. It's the idea that you can explain everything in the world, whether it's the Big Bang, the origin of the universe, right through to how the human brain works, ultimately in, in material terms. We don't have any idea uh, that there's anything supernatural there that's driving all this. Uh, and we, we, but we've also got, a, I, I would argue, a very sophisticated way of looking at the material world that, that goes beyond the mechanical materialism that you get with a lot of... Uh, uh, even in some sort of uh, important scientific ideas. Um, so Marx first spelled out this idea that um, science uh, in itself is a necessary part of human society. He said if the essence of objects coincided with the form of their outer manifestations, then every science would be superfluous. You know, the idea that the, 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 the world is going around the sun and not vice versa isn't actually common sense. It took science to establish that. But Lenin also came up with what, what I think is an important point, which is that it's not an, an easy path, really, to, to, to identifying what's real about the world, what's material. Uh, he said that human knowledge is not or does not follow a straight line, but a curve which endlessly approximates a series of circles, a spiral. So actually we're kind of always hovering around, also, always kind of approximating reality. Uh, and that's because, as, as Max Scott also shows, you know, it's not an obvious link between what we see and how the world actually is. But I think Marxists also have an important role to play in, in that critical way of looking at the world, which also goes beyond uh, some of the more commonsensical ideas that you get in, in, in science. So, for instance, on the one hand, Marx and Engels were really enthused by Darwin's theory of evolution, by natural selection, but they also recognise the kind of the bourgeois economic relations that was also quite central to the idea of the survival of the fittest, the kind of competition is the key, rather than cooperation, that kind of thing. And, and, and that's essentially the, the critical angle that I would hope that you know, we, we bring as Marxists to looking at science. So on the one hand, we are enthused by new scientific ideas, new ways of understanding the world, but we're also critical about the fact that this is essentially, science essentially evolves uh, in a particular society. It's affected by the ideas of that society, Given that we, work, we live in a capitalist society, that does mean that, that science is also affected by capitalism. Not just in the way it's used, not just in the technology. So Einstein's theories were used, you know, essentially to develop the, the, the atomic bomb. But also the very uh, ideas of science, whether it's evolution or, 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 or any other theory in science, has, has been influenced to some extent by being developed in a capitalist society. And that, that can actually start... Uh, the ideas. So, so, you know, this idea that we're always trying to sort of approximate reality can be actually distorted by the fact that the bourgeois ideas also shape uh, science. So I wanted to look really about some of the, the high points uh, of the Russian Revolution in terms of scientific uh, 
understanding scientific discovery. I'm only really going to look at a, a few areas really because of the, the time limits. And that was also true of the article that I wrote. There's only a limited amount I could talk about in the article. But um, essentially I want to look at two main areas. One is to look at uh, Vygotsky and uh, Voshinov's theory of the mind, which has already been covered to some extent this morning by a meeting that Jane did, but I want to sort of, sort of build on that, or at least add a few extra angles. Uh, and also then look at genetics. Um, because one thing I think we can say that about the Russian Revolution is, on the one hand it was this incredible you know, upsurge of, of working class struggle, for the first time the working class were in control of a, of a country, massive gains for women, uh, gay rights, LGBT rights, all sorts of major things happened, you know, Jews for the first time could play a prominent role in society, but it was also grasped by intellectuals at the time as, as a major, um, uh, of a major importance and um, the things it offered new ways of looking at the world. So this is actually a quote that, that, that Jane actually uh, mentioned in her uh, talk today about the gospel. I think it's worth repeating. This is a quote from Alexander Lurie, who was a close um, colleague of, of, of Vygotsky, who helped develop this, this new theory of the mind. And he said, I began my career in the first years of the Great Russian Revolution. From the outset, it was apparent that I would have little opportunity to pursue the kind of well-ordered, systematic education that serves as the cornerstone for most scientific careers. In its place, life offered me the fantastically stimulating atmosphere of an active, rapidly changing society. My entire generation was infused with the energy of revolutionary change, the liberating energy people feel when they are part of a society that is able to make tremendous progress in a very short time. And that, that kind of enthusiasm really uh, influenced uh, the way that um, Marxism was then able to transform certain fields. So I want to look at Vygotsky's theory of the mind, uh, because I think it was revolutionary. Because unlike some people at the time who really thought that uh, developing a Marxist theory of the mind meant just sticking to the old way of looking at things, whether it was behaviorism or Freudianism or, or introspection, um, which were the kind of dominant theories of the mind at that time, and, and tacking on a few quotations from Marx and Engels. Vygotsky realized that you really, if you were going to build a Marxist view of the mind, you had to start from the bottom up. You had to really go back to basics, go back to the root of what it means to be human, what it means to have a human mind you know, compared to an animal mind, an animal brain. Um, and so he talked about um, so I'll read this quote as well, I think it's worth reading. I don't want to discover the nature of mind by patching together a lot of quotations. I want to find out how science has to be built to approach the study of mind, having learned the whole of Marx's method. In order to create such an enabling theory method in this generally accepted scientific manner, it's necessary to discover the essence of this given area of phenomena, the laws according to which they change, their qualitative and quantitative characteristics, their causes. It's necessary to formulate the categories and concepts that are specifically relevant to them. In other words, to create one's own capital, but, but obviously for the sphere of psychology as opposed to economics. And one thing that Vygotsky did was look at what was already available in terms of theories of the mind, and then think you know, what was, how we could go beyond those. So he basically developed this idea that there was a, a crisis in psychology, um, and it was actually, despite what happened, you know, after in terms of Stalinism, when there was a clampdown on kind of ideas, you know, like Freudianism and that kind of thing. One of the things that I think was very important about the Russian Revolution in the in the twenties was how open the society was to looking at you know, ideas and and, 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 and trying to develop them. Um, so Vygotsky looked at the three main areas of psychology, as I've already mentioned, uh, William James' introspection, um, the, the the ideas that Pavlov de de developed about. Um, the way that reflexes in the brain uh, influence behaviour. So the behaviourist idea that basically that what happens outside the body has an impact um, in, in terms of condition reflexes, learned behaviour. And then Vygotsky also looked at the ideas of Freud, uh, who developed this idea of the unconscious. And he said that although these were very important insights that come from these three thinkers, uh, he noted two problematic tendencies within them. Uh, so one was that for, for each, the problem was, was the tendency for each insight to develop into an all-encompassing view of the mind that tended to exclude other viewpoints. So you've got, if you were Freudian, a, a Freudian then you would just ignore everything that the behaviourists were saying, or you'd ignore everything that William James was saying, uh, or vice versa. And the second tendency was for this worldview to begin to collapse under the weight of its own internal contradictions. So although it was a valid insight, Freud's 
view of the unconscious would eventually come to, to try and explain everything from you know World War Two to uh, communism you know to the all, all these kind of things and Vygotsky really said well th there's a problem in these approaches what we really need to do is to go back to what it means to be human and then try and develop what, what's unique about being human and then develop a mind uh, theory of the mind from that and actually it was inspired uh, by looking at the work of Fred Frederick Engels because Engels in the 19th century, come up with this, I think, revolutionary really uh, way of looking at how human evolution happened by recognizing that it was the use of tools and well, people first standing on two feet, gaining hands that they could then use to use tools. And this then led to a feedback process of cooperative labor, tool use, which helped the development of the brain. Um, and, and although this wasn't recognised as the correct sequence that you start with you know, on two legs, then you, you know, free the hands, then you get tool use, then the brain developed. Uh, this, was, this is now recognised to be the correct pattern uh, of human evolution. Um, and it was actually reading Engel's essay, uh, which was republished in Russia in the 1920s, that uh, gave Vygotsky the idea that you could view uh, words uh, as material force in the brain, acting upon the brain to transform the brain, in the same way that tools allow us to transform the world outside us. And I don't have really time to, to look in detail at Vygotsky's view of the mind, and, and Jane already did an extremely good um, meeting on this earlier today. But essentially, it's this idea that language and thought <coughs> are subtly interlinked, but essentially words are material objects in the brain that uh, I influence, uh, that, that help us to develop our thoughts and, and, and basically um, voice our thoughts, but also playing a, an important role in, in consciousness itself. Um, and also, this led to all sorts of important ideas at the time uh, in looking at child development, Vygotsky's idea of the zone of proximal development, the idea that um, basically what a learner, a, a learning child can do unaided, and what they can do with guidance uh, are, 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 are integrally linked. And so it goes against this idea that there's this kind of you know, a, a, a child's intelligence is like a fixed bucket full, full to a certain level. Instead, it's the idea that through cooperation, through working, not just with the teacher, but with the children, that a child can do way beyond what it might uh, initially be expected to do. So he was very much against the idea of you know, tests be, being used to just uh, fix the, 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 a child's uh, ability at a certain level. Instead, he saw this as a much more kind of dynamic process uh, and basically saw the potential in all children. Um, so that was very important in the, in the sphere of education. So it wasn't just a kind of an abstract view of, of, of the mind. It was one that had real implications for, develop, for, for education at the time. The, the Soviet Union was the first place where special needs education was developed properly. Uh, massive implications um, for, for, for society at the time. Uh, but also it's had a, a, a very important influence on educational theory ever since then. But I think Vygotsky's work goes way beyond just looking at child development. It also is really a way of, of trying to understand how the human mind itself works. So another important thinker um, at the time of, uh, was this guy, Valentin Voloshinov, who also developed this idea that inner speech is a key part of how the mind works. And also he developed an idea even more explicit than, than Migotsky, the idea that thought is a kind of a dialogue. So there's a kind of dialogue going on in our brains um, he once talked about um, how each individual engaged in horizontal and so social relationships with other individuals in specific speech acts, but also simultaneously in vertical internal relationships between the outer world and their own psyche. And so the psyche is not not is just sorry, the psyche is thus not an internal but a boundary phenomenon. Or as he put it, individual consciousness is not the architect of the ideological superstructure but only a tenant lodging in the social edifice of ideological science, which sounds like quite a mouthful, but it's essentially saying that um, the mind itself is a dialogue, society itself influences uh, our thoughts, and the other important aspect to all of this is it's a very dynamic relationship, so it helps us to understand how ideas can change during social struggle, and particularly during revolution, uh, in a way that makes material sense. Now, the point of all this is this was developed in the 1920s and 30s. They didn't know about DNA, they didn't know about uh, you know, many of the things we know now about neurons and the way the brain works. And I think what we really need to do is to, is to bring you know, Vygotsky and Voloshinov's ideas to a more modern level. But by, by tapping into what we're also learning from neuroscience and, and psychology. And that's something interesting that is starting to happen. There's a guy in Durham, uh, Charles Fernie Howe, who's actually trying to record in a speech uh, in a sort of indirect way. So there are people interested in looking at this. But I think what we as Marxists do is we bring a more radical element 
to understand that really you can only understand this dynamic side of the brain uh, of consciousness by also seeing that sight itself is, is, is potentially revolutionary, that things can change, the outside world can change, but so can ideas and struggle. So that's a very, very short uh, kind of um, a piece then about, about the, the theory of the mind developed in Vygotsky and Voloshinov. Uh, I'm now going to move on to a completely different area just to show that there were actually all sorts of other areas that developed uh, in science during the Soviet Union. And I want to look at uh, Vavilov's uh, theories about uh, gen genetic hotspots just to show how revolutionary some of the areas of genetics were that were developed during the Soviet Union. But I also want to later on show how unfortunately the rise of Stalin led to uh, a, a major step backwards uh, in, 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 in genetics in the Soviet Union. So Vavilov um, was uh, basically very interested in, in agriculture and in plants and in the genetics of, uh, of plants. And he, his big revela revelation uh, when, he was, uh, uh, when he was a young man was um, realising that through Mendel's theories of, of uh, how genetics works, that the, there were actually sort of laws and there were, there were, there were kind of um, rules that, that determined the way that genes are inherited. But what was, I think, his, his most revolutionary kind of contribution was that he realised that there were these genetic hotspots around the world, particularly in the tropics, particularly in the rainforests and things, where you had a, a, a concentration of genetic diversity. And this is important in two main ways. One is that this is a source of potential genetic material for agriculture. So if you want to develop agriculture, you need to go to these gene genetic hotspots and, and, and use the seeds that, that, that you find there, the plant varieties that you find there, to develop new plant varieties. But you also recognise that these are potentially very fragile um, hotspots. That if you start to destroy the rainforest, um, for instance, in the Amazon, that has a massive impact in terms of our, you know, what, what we've got to use with in the future. Um, and, and so it, it kind of prefigured really this idea that we need to protect our environment uh, and the rest of it. And actually, that was um, an idea that was actually really quite important in, in, in Russia at the time. We. I guess if you look back at the Soviet Union in its Stalinist days and you think about Chernobyl, you know, disasters, we often associate the Soviet Union with environmental disaster. That was very different, that was the complete opposite really in, in the early years of the revolution. Um, Lenin was particularly interested in um, uh, environmentalism. There was another guy called Vernadsky who developed the idea of the biosphere, which is the idea that there's this kind of thin layer of life uh, that, that covers the planet. Uh, and, and, and that this is, there's a very kind of subtle interaction going on between uh, the different aspects of the bi biosphere and that we need to protect this if we're going to not you know, end up with an environmental catastrophe. And Leonard insisted that a rational exploitation of the environment or the scientific management of natural resources in accord with the principles of conservation was essential. So completely against this idea we just, you know, rape the environment and, and, and don't think about the consequences. Uh, and Lenin actually had enormous respect for Vinansky and at his urging established in the southern Urals the world's first nature reserve uh, implanted by government exclusively aimed at the scientific study of, of nature. So that was, I think, the positive uh, things that we can say about genetics in the early years of the Soviet Union. But then things start to really change um, with the rise of Stalin. And in particular, you might have heard of a guy called Lysenko who came to dominate Soviet genetics. Now, in many ways, Lysenko was a good example of how ordinary people could, 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 could thrive in the Soviet Union. He was um, uh, born into a peasant family in the, in the previous, Stanley, uh, in the previous kind of Tsarist Russia. He would never have had an education, become a, a, a well-known scientist, the rest of it. It was only through the revolution that he was able to then study, go to a school of agriculture and horticulture, uh, and this, this was a sign of what you could do at the time of the revolution. Unfortunately, with the rise of Stalin, pseudoscience began to come to the fore instead of um, real scientific ideas. And uh, Lysenko came up with this idea, it wasn't actually novel to him, but came with this idea that by changing the environment of a plant, uh, you could affect its uh, ability to flower at particular times of the year. So this w was used to basically say that genetics was complete nonsense. Uh, it was more going back to the ideas of, of Lamarck, that it was the environment that ultimately shaped um, uh, the, 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 the organism. So, so really it was a kind of mirror of the idea of behaviourism that the, uh, the body was just a blank slate that you could superimpose uh, whatever ideas on. This was the idea that you could just change a plant by changing its environment. And it's interesting that nowadays we're learning that there is a certain truth to this. You know, so-called epigenetics shows that the environment does actually have an impact on, on the genome, does actually affect 
uh, the genes. Unfortunately, the way that Lysenko did his science was done in a completely unscientific uh, way. And what was even worse was it was then used to attack people like Vavilov. Um, and <coughs> what was the basic situation was that at that time, because of the botched kind of indu massive industrialization, forced industrialization under Stalin, there was a major crisis in agriculture. So people like Stalin looked to Lysenko as offering some kind of solution to this. In fact, Lysenko's ideas made things far, far worse in the process. Vavilov was, was locked away, died of starvation, uh, and it was a, a, you know, a major problem uh, at the time that basically this, this, ama this amazing genetics and all these people that developed these uh, really important ideas, it wasn't just in, in plants, it was in, in all sorts of other aspects of genetics, were basically you know, dis destroyed, wiped out uh, by, by Stalinism. And, and that was important not only for the Soviet Union, but also because the Soviet Union had a very positive impact initially on the scientific left around the world, but eventually the, 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 the rise of Stalinism and what happened to the revolution, the degeneration of the revolution, also affected uh, the, the people in, in other countries. So I want to just look briefly at uh, the situation in Britain. So for instance, we don't tend to think of Cambridge, England, as being a hotbed of communism, hotbed of radicalism. And yet in the 1930s, that was the case. A um, person who would la la later go on to get a Nobel Prize um, Max Perutz, who was basically a refugee from, 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 from the Nazis, from, from Austria, when the Nazis came to power there, uh, started work doing a PhD in Cambridge in the 1930s. Uh, and he expected the first question he would be asked when he arrived in the lab would be all sorts of questions about science. But the first question was, are you a communist? And it turned out that not only was his, his lab head, J.D. Bernal, uh, a communist, but also many other people in the lab. And the people who weren't communists were kind of influenced by the ideas of communism and the rest of it. And that reflected the fact that the Russian Revolution was, was seen as a beacon uh, for so many people around the world. And that also influenced the scientific left. And that had a big uh, impact because on the one hand it meant that uh, trade unionism uh, of people in the universities was, 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 was really become an important uh, thing. For the first time, scientific workers became unionised, started to fight for better paying conditions. But it also had other knock-on effects. There was a, a major movement against fascism. Remember, the Nazis were come to power in Germany. The, 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 um, uh, the black shirts were marching uh, in, in, in England. And there, were, there was a real movement against the fascists at the time in places like Cambridge. And you got some major scientists at the time, people like J.B.S. Haldane, who was a famous geneticist, who joined the Communist Party at that time because of, of, of the influence, uh, not just of their activism, because they were the best activists, but also because of their ideas about science and society, the most sophisticated ideas uh, that appeal to people like uh, Haldane. So this is actually a picture in the middle there of um, Haldane um, speaking at a rally in, in Trafalgar Square. Um, and they did all sorts of practical things like in the run-up to the Second World War, they campaigned for better air aid protection, uh, for instance. Also important, it wasn't just men that were involved in this movement, but people like Dorothy Hodgkin who would later get the Nobel Prize for her work on, on penicillin and vitamin D, um, which was also an important aspect of the movement at that time. Um, and this also led to some important uh, scientific theories. So Haldane and a Russian scientist called Operin, um, for instance, came up with the, the first uh, theory of how life had first evolved, because Darwin had explained how life uh, evolved, you know, organisms, new species coming to being, uh, that kind of thing, but he never actually explained how life itself had arisen in the first place. And building on kind of dialectical ideas that, that a, a, a situation can become completely transformed through a dialectical progression, um, both Oprin and Haldane, sort of working independently at first, but then uh, discussing their ideas, came up with the idea that initially the world was a completely different place than the one we know now. So now we take it for granted that there's oxygen in the atmosphere uh, and, you know, and there's life around us. In fact, what we now think, based on Oprin and Haldane's ideas, and, and it's been backed up by all sorts of <coughs> experimental evidence since then, uh, is that originally the world, Earth was a completely different kind of place. It was high in methane, um, CO2, and it was really only through uh, you know, events like um, volcanoes erupting or lightning that, those, that, that initial environment got transformed, first of all through the development of um, amino acids and, and DNA and RNA through <coughs> chemical reactions. But then as life itself then started to develop, you got 
um, the production of oxygen, this transformed the atmosphere and meant that you know you then ended up with organisms like ourselves that actually rely on oxygen. I mean, one time oxygen was the last thing organisms wanted; it, it was the it was poison. But but through the process of, of producing oxygen, this completely transformed the world. Um, and so this was a really good, I think, ex uh, example of how dialectical explanations of, 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 of not just society, but also of the natural world, can actually have be, be important scientifically. So I want to really just uh, end with this part of the talk by looking at the, the fact that this, this scientific left that developed in Britain, and also in other places in the world, in the 1930s, eventually all came crashing down. So that happened after the war, really. They, they built up in this amazing movement. They had a really good interaction with scientists. You know, it was almost like the Communist Party's ideas dominated, really, the, the, not just the, 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 the scientific left, uh, but also science in general. You, you had you know, articles in Nature basically putting forward many of the ideas associated with the scientific left. But it all came crashing down after the Second World War. Now, this was partly the result of the Cold War and the fact that, you know, really this clash between the Soviet Union and, uh, and, and, and the West, which had been allies uh, in, in the Second World War, but afterwards then there was this kind of the Cold War developed. It was partly the, the, a result of that that the scientific left became, uh, we were attacked uh, as, as part of that Cold War ideology. But I think it also reflected some real weaknesses within the scientific left. So on the one hand, uh, the Communist Party, the people in the Communist Party, the scientific left in the Communist Party, built up the, the kind of popular front model. And, and as soon as the Cold War came about, then those alliances that they made turned out to be not as strong as they thought. But I think it also reflected the fact that they put their faith so much uh, in, 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 um, in, in the idea that, Stan that socialism equates Stalinism, that when scandals uh, came, to, came, came to light, such as the, the, what was going on in Russia with the Lysenko affair, you know, Vavilov, this famous geneticist, basically starved to death in a prison in, so in the Soviet Union. That led to uncomfortable parallels between what had happened in Hitler's Germany and what was happening to scientists in, um, in the Soviet Union. And, and really, you know, it, it, it really pulled the whole movement apart. So, for instance, people like Haldane, who was one of the foremost geneticists in, in Britain, left the, 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 the CP at that time because of, of this, of what happened in the Soviet Union. So unfortunately, this is the kind of uh, inability to distinguish between uh, Stalinism and socialism was the undoing of the scientific left at that time. I, I should say there were some scientists who stood out against that, you know, never really gone along with the, the Stalinism, but they were very much a minority. And, and because of that, the scientific left was really disappeared for, for, for really um, at least a decade. But it did resurge again, because the left does tend to resurge uh, when, when struggle happens again. And it particularly happened in the uh, 1960s and 70s. And the reasons for this, and I want to just look you know, briefly at what happened in the US, but this was something again happening across the world, was that there were some major issues that, 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 that affected uh, people in the universities, but were also particularly relevant to, to scientists. So the Vietnam War, you know, massive weapons of destruction were used in the Vietnam War, bombers, dropping bombs, more than had been dropped, I think, in the whole of the Second World War. Um, things like Agent Orange, this was a chemical that had been developed through scientific research <coughs> looking at plant hormones, but was basically used to eradicate whole swathes of, 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 of agriculture in, in Vietnam. And not only that, but it carried health risks, there were babies being born in Vietnam, um, you know, with it, it, abnormalities, even affected the, 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 the American uh, soldiers as well to some extent. And all this was starting to come out, this, this evidence for this was starting to come out uh, in the 1960s. So, you know, many scientists who worked in the US universities were horrified that their work had been used in this way. There were other things uh, that at that time, because of the civil rights movement, because of black struggle, uh, there was a lot of pseudo-scientific uh, stuff about, you know, blacks being less intelligent. Uh, and, and so people uh, on the left started to get involved in having debates with these racist ideas and basically saying, well, there's no scientific evidence, there's any difference between, you know, black and white in, in terms of intelligence, brain structure, anything else. And then finally, um, women in the, in, in, in the scientific workforce uh, were first starting to really challenge the idea that they were secondary citizens, that they could be portrayed in sexist ways, uh, they could be, um, and that also led to a major upsurge um, of the scientific left. Um, and what I find really quite interesting at this time is how closely um, cutting-edge science 
came together with activism. So, for instance, the first person to, to physically isolate a gene, the so-called LAC gene, which controls the metabolism of the sugar lactose in bacteria, as a reward for his efforts, uh, this was a guy called Jonathan Beckwith, um, so this was in 1969, as a reward for his efforts, he was awarded a prize by the drug company Eli Lilly um, of $1,000, which I think was a lot of money at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but instead of keeping the money, he gave it to the Black Panther Party, who were obviously <laughs> quite um, <coughs> prominent at that time, and were fighting a, a campaign against uh, repression by the police. Um, another activist, another famous scientist who became an activist was uh, Matt Patashny, uh, showing the kind of hippie spirit of the times. Uh, a journalist who interviewed him at this time uh, in his lab noted his aviator-style spectacles, T-shirt, sawed off blue denim shorts and sandals more exposed skin than appeared prudent in a lab laboratory um, but at the same time as being a, a great scientist who was actually working on ways to purify the protein that regulate this lac gene so basically the first proteins that, that regulate how genes are turned on and off uh, Patashny was highly involved in the anti-war movement and even went to North Vietnam where he gave talks both about his scientific work but also about his work in the anti-war movement um, now, the only problem was that there were divergences on the scientific left that would eventually come to a head. And this was partly, uh, I think you can say again, that the scientific left eventually degenerated really in, in the late 70s. And this was partly a reflection of other tensions that were happening at the time. The, the downturn in, 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 the, in the economy led to a downturn in, in, in struggle eventually. Um, there were also ideas that women should organise separately than men. There were all sorts of tensions that are familiar to the left at that time, not just the scientific left. But there were particular tensions in the scientific left, which I think are worth mentioning. I've only really got time to, to skim over them, really, which um, relate to our, um, our attitude to, to certain scientific science and scientific technologies. And in particular, I think it was attitudes to so-called recombinant DNA technology. So this is the ability to cut and paste DNA in a test tube uh, that, that really created some rifts within the um, scientific left. So. For instance, uh, at that time it was first becoming possible to cut and paste genes in a test tube and this led to the development of, for instance, bacteria that could excrete um, insulin, so that would be important for diabetics. But this was the first time in which DNA technology was being used uh, also in, in, in a commercial sense, so it you know, led to the birth of biotechnology. And so you've, you've clearly got there um, a situation where capitalism is starting to dominate this particular area of, of, of science. Um, there were also fears about the safety of this new technology. There was actually a conference called the Astyloma Conference in 1975 where scientists actually got together to uh, debate whether this technology was safe at, at, to even use at all. And in the end, they came up with the idea that as long as you could regulate the technology, then it, didn't, it shouldn't pose a threat. But it did lead to all sorts of uh, different opinions. And in particular, I think it really led to a split between uh, people on the scientific left, people like Richard Lewontin, who basically opposed recombinant DNA technology and would later go on to oppose the Human Genome Project because he saw it as so wedded uh, with, with the capitalist ideology, as well as uh, this being uh, a, 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 a big business that he thought that th these were not really uh, useful uh, developments. In contrast, Matt Patashny, we mentioned earlier on, uh, refused to go along with the idea that recombinant DNA technology was primarily a problem, seen as a massive opportunity for medical research and clinical medicine. I remember bona fide lefty until years later when I grew up with the left of recombinant DNA, said Patashny. They said we should oppose the experiments because they were dangerous, mobilising the masses and all that. Trouble was, it wasn't true. Now, where do I stand on all this question? Well, in articles that I've written, you know, in the review or in the, in the ISJ, I, I guess I have a position that's somewhere in between of that, really, in the, in the sense that there's no doubt at all that uh, recombinant DNA technologies and genomics, as it's been developed in capitalist society, not only uh, can be used in, in some potentially quite um, problematic ways. You know, for instance, DNA testing, is it going to be used to discriminate rather than help people? For instance, the ideology of capitalism affects this, this kind of pursuit. Um, the Human Genome Project, we were told that it would mean we, we would know what it means to be a human being. This was a massive oversimplification uh, of, of how we can use that kind of data. On the other hand, as I've argued in books like The Deeper Genome, I believe that actually things like the genome product have actually led to a, a much better understanding of the complexity uh, of the genome and the link between biology and society. So actually, 
uh, I side with Tashi in, that, in the sense of uh, seeing these as positive elements. But I think these are very important arguments to have because if we want to just now turn to the prospect for the scientific left today, I start with a slide earlier, right at the start of the talk, basically posing you know, the problems that we face. We've got global warming, which could destroy civilization, might even take us to a situation where, you know, like the planet Venus, it's, I don't know, 250 degrees. This, this is a serious possibility if we don't do something. You know, um, is it, I will, but it's going to take our jobs. Um, only if we allow it to, to a situation where capitalism can basically just use technology to, you know, destroy the job, jobs rather than making things easier for people. New technologies for war, all sorts of possibilities there that could be used. Um, to, to, to harm people in all sorts of new, more creative ways. At a time when you know, half of all research money goes to the military, why is it not going to uh, you know, medical research, that kind of thing? Issues posed by the new genetic technologies. Personally, I think that there's some amazing possibilities now in being able to modify the genome, for instance, to treat diseases like cystic fibrosis, cancer, all those kind of things. But it also um, raises the question of, you know, why is it that we live in a society where uh, you can sequence a baby's genome in 50 hours for $1,000 to, to, to identify a problem uh, that they may be killing that baby even as it's in the first few years of life. How can we do that at the same time as a child in Africa you know, might be la dying for, for lack of clean water? And so I think that raises the, 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 the ups the stakes really. We've got this amazing scientific technology, this amazing scientific ideas, new advances keep being made all the time. Genome editing was actually the product of two women in science. You know, it shows how women are playing a, a, a more and more important role in science. But I think if we really want to use science in the way it really could be, be used to, 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 to help all humanity, rather than just a tiny minority, we do need a very different society. We need a revolution. We need a, a social society. And so that's why the scientific left today, uh, although it's a shadow of its former self, is I think we need to rebuild that scientific left because there's no doubt at all there's been a shift you know, in recent months in terms of people's ideas about what we can achieve. That should also be the case for people who work in the universities who want to see science channeled in a positive way, uh, in, in a socialist direction, uh, and not just used to, to just help the few people. So you've already heard about the, the further reading, but um, I'll end it there. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, I, uh, uh, what's name? Uh, John. John, thank you very much. I'm afraid I missed the first ten minutes, but nevertheless it was uh, very interesting. I just want to make a contribution, uh, which is that I saw a YouTube video uh, talking about what uh, NASA could do with the US military budget. Now, of course, it would probably be better to go on sort of science and climate change before we think about space. But what we could do is we could build massive telescopes which make um, Hubble seem like virtually nothing. We could, you know, build moon bases. We could, uh, you know, uh, create artificial gravity space stations. We could even, if we used the whole budget, uh, in 10 years have a margin population of 50,000, as well as also uh, you know, with Europa, because Europa is, you know, icy with a Jupiter, it might have water underneath and there could be life if the US military budget, uh, but it's per year. So, you know, if we use one year's budget, we could send a um, probe to Europa which could go underneath the, uh, uh, break through the ice. I just think it's utter madness that, uh, you know, we could, um, you know, improve ourselves as a civilization in so many ways, but instead we just spend it all on killing each other. Um, that's all I'd say, really. Uh, just to add to a conversation I had with John this morning, to say that it wasn't just happening in the sciences at development, but also in the arts. And I just wanted to put a plug in for Kazimir Malevich, who it's the centennial of the Black Square, but also he wrote a book that's just recently been accurately translated, The World as Objectlessness, i.e. the objects actually don't exist, which they don't on a, a molecular level, but it puts a, still a revolutionary thought in... in Thank you very much, everybody.
Thank you very much. Comment at the front and then take the comment with us at that. Yeah, it's great to have, can you hear me? It's great to have a, a talk on science, um, always great in this kind of context because it, it's very important. Um, I want to talk about science uh, being fetishized under capitalism, that, it's, that it is presented to us as a thing. Um, the science says, the science is uh, a thing that sort of stands above society that can be used for good or can be used for bad. Um, but it's not a thing. Science is, if we go back to the root of what it means, it's a human activity. It's the activity of acquiring knowledge, the tools used to acquire knowledge, the, and the way that that knowledge is implemented. So it's a human activity. It's embedded in a class context. Um, so it's, this means that when the capitalist class is ascendant, you know, when it's dominant, science capitalist class is the dominant class, and so all science under capitalism is directed to advance in the interests of the capitalist class. At times when the working class is moving forward and more confident, then science can, oh, possibilities for using science in different ways emerge. And this is where scientists who are socialists or left-wing can begin to have some influence and can begin to make some headway. But they, that can only go so far under capitalism because science is um, as part of the productive forces, it is uh, fettered um, by capitalism, and um, which means that the only way we can shift science towards the interests of the working class is to shift the balance of class struggle, the balance of class forces, um, and ultimately to have socialist revolution. So in, I guess the answer to the question of how do we build the scientific left is we have to build the working class forces. We have to build the left. We have to build a socialist current inside the working class because that is what then leads to left-wing perspectives on all kinds of, of human activity, activity areas, including science. Um, before we jump on that t-shirt, by the way, there. I've got a question, really. I'm, I'm not a scientist, so it's very much a layperson's question. Um, I have been active in a group called Protect Our NHS in Bristol, which um, was very much concerned a couple of years back with the care.data um, debacle. And I'm interested in the way that personal, our own personal medical data is commodified, bought and sold under capitalism. And um, as people may well remember, um, the, the thing that was um, disturbing about care.data was that we were all encouraged to share our data um, or in fact, we weren't so much encouraged as it was taken out of our hands. Our medical data was just basically put into this big database. And the idea was that this was supposed to be a very good thing because it was going to be used to advance scientific research. But it turned out that it was popping up in the databases of insurance companies and commercial entities and that it was being bought and sold for all kinds of purposes. And um, we have to acknowledge that our own medical data, that this enormous body of you know, information taken from us is, is commodified, is a very valuable commodity. And I wondered how we should relate to that as, as campaigners, as people trying to defend our NHS. Obviously, it is a good thing if the stuff is, is, is shared and used for the right purpose, and it's a bad thing if it isn't. And uh, can we ever trust um, any system to do a good job of this under capitalism? Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, medical research, although I'm not qualified in, in any medical sense, but um, yeah, I'm involved in public health. Um, we're facing a public health tsunami of chronic illness um, throughout the globe, you know, one, one aspect of which is diabetes. For example, there, there are um, Australian or New Zealand doctors who go to Pacific Islands every month or two to amputate people's toes and feet because there's chronic diabetes on the island, on the island, the Pacific Islands because of Western diet. And yet there are other islands, very similar, similar populations where they're still eating their, more their traditional diet of coconuts and fish where the incidence of diabetes and chronic illness is, is very much less. Now although that doesn't prove that diet causes the diabetes, you know, science is about rational thought, and any rational 
thought would, would indicate that that's where some of the medical research should be going. And yes, in many cases, the medical research gets, and the money goes towards things that can be patented, yeah. or things that you can make a profit out of, because you can't patent a diet. You know, there's no money to be made out of changing people's diets. Um, and so it goes in insulin pumps and bariatric surgery and all kinds of directions, you know, which uh, probably, they, they ameliorate the problem, but they don't solve the problem. And uh, interesting direction where, where things are perhaps improving is where um, there's a doctor, a GP, NHS GP, working with a psych psychiatrist, psychologist, um, working collectively with, with his patients um, so that they uh, are acting as a team really where the patients and, and the medical practitioners are working together to change people's diets so that they can come off medication of, of insulin and so on and, and improve their diabetes. And he's getting a lot of success with it. And what he says is that in one year for one GP's uh, surgery, he's cut the drugs bill by £40,000 just in that one year. Um, and perhaps that's, that's potentially a way, way forward. But you can see as well from that that basically there's an enormous amount of money being made from medications. And it's actually a threat, isn't it, to uh, the profits that people are making from drugs. And because, I'm interested what, what the speaker's got to say about this, but research money is often comes from or is directed by uh, the businesses that make money from it, and they're going to direct money away from what in rational terms you would want the money to go towards, simply to, uh, to, to look after their profits. But collectively, there must be a way for us to, to fight back about against this and make sure the resources go in the, in the correct direction. And then we'll take the comrade at the back of short hair and glasses next. Yeah, um, my contribution, I think, kind of following on a similar vein to the previous contributor, um, in that it's important to understand, I mean, science is amazing, you know, the, the scientific advances that can massively improve people's lives, but the direction of scientific research is at the moment, you know, influenced by, by you know, by profit, by capitalism, and not for what actually benefits, not for the benefit of the human race. If you look at sort of um, drug companies, big pharma, medical research, at the moment we're sort of teetering on the, the brink of a, a massive sort of catastrophe in terms of antibiotic resistance, um, and sort of essentially, you know, drugs uh, illnesses sort of what you know essentially wipe the human race out because we're running out of antibiotics to treat them. Um, and, but it's actually not cost effective for drug companies to research, put loads of research into new antibiotics that are essentially just going to be kept on the shelf as sort of last resort drugs and only ever used really, really sparingly, um, because, you know, only taken in short courses because it's not sort of, um, you know, financially worth it for them, whereas they, they choose to sort of put money into coming up with ever, ever, you know, new variations on existing drugs and things that need to be taken for, you know, for long periods of time for chronic conditions and stuff. So, you know, I think what, um, you know, attracts me to Marxism and socialism is it's a very scientific form of socialism, but I think really um, the only sort of, you know, the, the only way science can ever realise its full potential is, you know, and, you know, we need a revolution, we need, um, you know, a socialist society so that we can actually, you know, to, um, so that we can actually kind of sort of use it for the, for the benefit of, of the many and not the few. Um, Thank you very much. the question around research actually because um, I don't really understand it, I'm not a scientist but it would seem to me that if you're a, a scientist on the left and your means of doing research is funded by people that you don't agree with and they also retain the right of intellectual property over what you are producing then you're in a big dilemma about how you relate to that um, and I'd quite like a, a, you know, if the speaker could come back on that, because I think it's a really important point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to take a uh, comrade at back from there. 
Yeah, I'd absolutely agree that um, capitalism is still science. And that, um, you know, we need, yeah, at the end of the day, democratic control from below if we are going to use science to benefit humankind. But what I would say is that as socialists we do need to defend science, I think, um, and the scientific method. Um, for example, John talked about Hanatsky, who came up with the concept of the, the biosphere. Uh, he he uh, realised that there was a relationship between carbon dioxide and biological life. And uh, I'm a biogeochemist, and he, he, led, he led the uh, actual, he, he's a father of biogeochemistry. And um, now, climate change, etc., man induced climate change, we know from scientific inquiry, is the real thing. And we're able to, um, you know, we're able to look at scientific facts, use a scientific method to show that this is occurring. Even though we have people like Donald Trump who still insist on, or the DUP who insist on denying that climate change uh, is a, is a man-induced, a, a human-induced activity uh, and uh, is, up, is caused by anthropogenic forcing, we can point to real scientific facts. So I think um, what someone was saying earlier about grants, actually you can use some of the money maybe to look at specific problems they, the, 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 the corporations can't guide the way um, scientific research goes. If you find out something is true, and it actually ends up undermining capitalist society, the classic example of that probably, in, uh, the, well, there's all sorts of um, examples, I think, you can come up with you know, Darwin and evolution, etc. But I think we can use the scientific method, we can, we can use, those money to, use that money to actually find out what is going on, what is the truth of the situation. And in some, set, in some aspects, science can actually undermine the, um, the you know, ruling class ideas to some extent. So I think what we need to do, I think, um, I think it's absolutely right, we need to rebuild the scientific left. I'm a member of UCU, which is the, the lecturers union. A lot of scientists are actually casualised, and I think for us to rebuild the scientific, one way of doing it is through the trade union, and to um, we can what we're doing, what we have now is a pay freeze. We need to argue that that pay freeze needs to be broken. There's a there's a ballot going on in higher education at the moment. Um, we need to um, uh, we we need to reject that because that will help us fight also fight casualisation in universities. Thanks. Next, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll take it into the back after. Sorry, blue t-shirt, blue t-shirt. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, she's absolutely fine. Oh, right, sorry. Yeah. So I just wanted to come back on the question of research. Now, I've just started my research career in biochemistry, and the problem in our field is that so much of the funding comes from big pharma and from capitalists, and thus the research and our findings and the new technologies belongs to them. Um, and this really does shape public opinion. For example, the recombinant DNA technology that John was talking about, it can be used to create life-saving insulin for diabetics, new cancer treatments, but can also be used to make GM crops for Monsanto that wreak havoc on the environment on people's lives. And whilst we do need a proper revolution to address this, to get scientific research into the hands of the people, um, in the meantime, I would really encourage all of you to put pressure on our governments and our public bodies to fund non-military research and if you can, to support the charities that fund life-saving research and biomedical sciences um, that won't keep the findings in their hands and won't use people's lives for profits. Thank you. Yeah, it's really a question to John and people who are also working in the uh, scientific field because uh, I'm an engineer and I went up the management tree and I got to a point where I could lead a team of people but I refused and I failed so many interviews to go any higher because then I would be in a higher and fire position. So for me it was fairly clear where the stop off point was. Now my brother has also joined the SWP about the same time as me and about a few years ago I realised 
he's become a liberal. Uh, he wasn't even a socialist. And it's because he's a scientist. And, and in his work, what he was doing, and he went through all the processes you need to do. He wrote papers, he led a team, and now he's in a, in a, a professorship uh, position. But I never thought there was, I couldn't see, and when I'm talking to him and arguing with him, where was the stop off point? Where do you actually say, I don't want to go any higher because that means that I'm having a, an, you know, an influence on people and I'm in a sort of higher and fire type position? Um, where, and when we're talking with scientists, what does that mean? Do we actually say to people, you don't go to the professorships because then you had influences over you know, your graduates and so on and so forth in that team? It's, it's, I would like to know, you know, we've obviously said we want society to control and have decisions over the scientists, but where is the in-between between where we are now and maybe maybe have a left-wing science in, in the, at the moment. Okay. Right, can we just borrow that for a minute and we can take the man with the hat afterwards and then the lady with the red hair. I think, um, I think Many people's scepticism of science, I think it's the increasing privatisation of science funding, whereas before there was more state funding, but when it's within influence of neoliberalism, stretching its arms, that's a thing that is increased contributed to people's cynicism. But it's not the scientific method's fault, it's the, um, the problem is um, private, private industry funding things, and there should be a lot more... I mean, I mean, even before we have a revolution, we should be demanding more nationalisation. We should be demanding that the government fund scientific projects, not to try and control what they do, but actually, you know, state funding of, like, state funding of the NHS, state funding of hospitals, state, fund, state funding of scientific research. So that's a reform that people can fight for. I want to make a different point. Um, on the issue, I mean, I, obviously I agree about we need more building of the scientific left. Um, and the issue about science being a human activity, there was, I think, yes it is, but I think we've got to be careful, it's a specific form of human activity, otherwise we can end up being a bit reductionist here, because um, religion is another form of human activity, but that's not the same as science. I mean, obviously someone can believe in God, and still believe in the scientific methods, I'm not going into a subject about Marxism and religion, but what I'm trying to say is, scientific method of testing a hypothesis, and trying to find out something, and doing research, it's a better way to try and find out something more about the world than simply making assumptions. I know that scientists are part of this world, they also can be influenced by racist, sexist ideology, class divided ideology, they have their own prejudices and their own assumptions, but the scientific method itself, the thing to aim for, to try and be as objective as one can, which I realise is not 100% is not possible, but that, that aim is something which is, that sets science as being something separate, not above society, but it's a specific thing, it's, it sets it apart from making assumptions about things, and it's something that people should aim for. So I don't, it is a human activity, but it shouldn't be seen as just another human activity, because it isn't, which is why I think people should defend science, we should fight to improve science, and fight to push private profit out of it, or at least to minimise the effect of capitalists trying to control it. I'm going to take uh, the comrade with the hat and the comrade with the red hair, and I've got time for no other speakers, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah, I heard recently that one of the phil philanthropic billionaires, and I can't remember each, which one it was, was going to set up a fund to uh, cure all diseases. And I wonder if that's uh, fake news, whether it's possible, whether it's a good thing, whose diseases he'd be talking about. Um, and. Uh, is, and, and, and isn't it possible that if you really wanted to do that, we could save millions of lives tomorrow for, for much less? Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand back now to John, who's going to sum up. Um, so, over to you. Thank you. Well, as usual, a really interesting discussion. I think, really, if we're going to tackle some of these questions, and I'll try and go through as many as I can, we do need to have, I think, a dialectical point of view about what we're talking about, because... Uh, there can be a danger in, in going to one side or the other side and not actually realising that the, uh, some, the, the answer may be somewhere in the middle. I mean, this idea about is science progressive under capitalism is it, or is it inherently tainted by capitalism, I, I think it's neither is true. I mean, th thinking back to the Communist Manifesto, one of the perhaps surprising things in first reading that book for some people is that it's not just uh, a criticism of capitalism, it's all about the amazing things that capitalism so far has done for the world. Now, if Marx and Engels would come back today and see 
you know, genome editing or iPads or computers, all these things. I mean, they'd be amazed, but I think also they would see this as the way that capitalism works. It is about accumulations, about, it's about new technology, it's an amazing thing. I think the problem is, is that the, the, the values of capitalism imbue all of science and all of technology. But that's not to say there's not progress under capitalism. It is important that we can now sequence the genome, that we can now modify a single base in the genome, that we can create these amazing computer technologies. These could all be used to help people, potentially, yeah? So I think that's important. So the, and, and the important thing, as some other people have said about science, is the scientific math method does matter. It's all about understanding the world, and get, getting a better idea about the world, testing ideas against reality. Now, going on to uh, the actual specific points, NASA, should the uh, US military budget be used to fund space travel, climate change work? Absolutely. I mean, I grew up uh, in, the, in the 60s, I remember seeing the moon landings. I, I assumed, like people at the time, we'd soon be living on the moon, you know, space 1999, remember that? That, that was, it didn't happen, did it? And the reason was that the capitalist crisis basically led to end to all that. Now, the problem is, is that NASA and the military are intertwined, actually. So, the, you know, the moon race was actually also about uh, competition, military competition. But, yeah, they could, we could do amazing things if we, if we didn't put all that money into, uh, in, into the military. I think our first priorities would be, you know, how do we just solve starvation, ill health, that kind of thing. But yeah, I'd love to think of a socialist federation spread out across the solar system even further. It'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Um, it was some way away still. This issue about Malevich. Um, yeah, science and art in the Russian Revolution were quite intertwined. We often tend to separate the two. There was a renaissance that went on in Russia after the revolution. People like Vygotsky worked closely with uh, film directors, revolutionary film directors like Eisenstein, for instance. That was a sign of the ferment at the times. Fantastic ideas, not just about science, about art, they often the, the two came together. Um, science is a human activity, is science objective? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that, that science is no doubt a human activity. It is affected by, by the society it's under. But as I said right at the start, it, there's a danger in thinking that science is, is only about the values of capitalism. It, it's about understanding more about the world. I think in that sense there's a bit of a distinction between the social sciences and the capitalism, which by and large in the mainstream, you, you know, in the universities are used, I think, to pull the wool over people's eyes, uh, whether it's you know, economics or politics. It's very difficult to get hearing for real radical ideas. Capitalism needs things to work. It needs technology to work. That's why you can make revolutionary discoveries under capitalism, even if as been, while you've been funded you know, by the capitalist system. But, but it is distorting the cat science as well. It's, 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 again, it comes back to this sort of dialectical contradiction, really. Medical data, yeah. Um, this thing about uh, will our DNA da data be used against us? I think it all depends on the system we live under. If you're in a society like the United States where uh, uh, healthcare is private, it's all about insurance, undoubtedly that kind of information could be used against you. If we had a fully funded NHS where there was no real limit to, to using uh, public funds to help people, personalised medicine has been talked about, that could be a reality more and more I think with, with, with some of the new developments. There wouldn't be a problem about worrying about whether your data was going to be used by an insurance company. Now would it be safe, could we trust that data not to be used in, in other ways? Obviously not, that there is a problem there, but I think that's why we do need as a society to really make full use and safe use of this kind of data. But, you know, it's happening. The data is accumulating. It's already happened. That's, that's the other side of this. It's not something that is so easy to, to kind of stop, but we should be campaigning for proper uh, scrutinisation of the way this data has been kept. We should be campaigning for it to be only used in a, in a, in a personalised uh, sorry, in, in, in a public health system. We should be arguing against the idea that you can patent, you know, DNA data, for instance. Like that's one thing we can say. Technologies, genome editing technology, it was developed in the public sphere. Why are they fighting a patent battle over it at the moment? Two publicly funded universities, well, they're public funded, but anyway, it was publicly funded work, and yet Harvard and Bar Berkeley are fighting for the patent rights. We should be opposed to that. The good thing is that there are some prominent scientists like John Solston, Nobel Prize winner, who is also against the pe patenting of, of life in that way. Uh, a point about diabetes and diet yeah I mean it, it, it's a very good point that we, we, it's interesting that we learn more and more about the genetics of diabetes we, we do understand that certain people are more susceptible to diabetes because of certain very subtle genetic differences but this the, the most obvious cause of the rise in diabetes worldwide is the rise in obesity which is all linked to junk food 
bad diets, the rest of it. It's, I think the, the person also said you can't patent a diet. Well, actually, you can. There are patented diets. They're junk diets. They're useless diets. 95% of diets don't work. The irony is that the same companies that are patenting those junky diets that don't work are the same ones selling the junk food. There's a literal, it's, it's the same people. You know, we, we should be arguing for um, public subsidies for healthy food, you know, in, 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 the, 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 there should be a, a, a limit to how much these companies can sell this kind of rubbish. Because, quite right, it, it is one of the primary causes of, of diabetes. At the same time, I think it, it's good that we can actually learn more about the basic mechanisms that can lead to diabetes, because that can actually lead to uh, new drug treatments, uh, new ways of, uh, of preventing diabetes. So I think that the two can go side by side. Antibiotic resistance, it, it, it's, it's been called a ticking time bomb by Sally Davis, who's the you know the chief kind of medic who works for the government. Um, I mean, it is partly a natural thing that happens with with with, with antibiotics that bacteria by natural selection will get resistant. Pe you know, Fleming prophesied this about penicillin that there'd soon be resistance to it. The problem is it's exacerbated by misuse of antibiotics in society. So you might not be aware, but ten times more antibiotics are used in agriculture to basically cover over the fact that in, you know, industrialised farming is done in such unsanitary conditions that they need the antibiotics to you know, basically keep the animals from, from pegging it. That has an impact because those, the, those bugs that then get resistant in agriculture you know, go into the human chain and, and cause antibiotic resistance. And it's also true that there are some really quite innovative ways now of producing new antibiotics. Someone's developed a soil hotel that allows you to grow the bacteria that, that produce antibiotics. Because it's funny, but bacteria themselves produce antibiotics as well to, to attack other bacteria. So we actually get some of our most interesting antibiotics from bacteria. And they've found new ways to culture these bacteria from the soil in ways that allow us to produce more antibiotics. But is there major funding for this? No, because as someone said, it's not, it's not that profitable. Um, this point about funding for science, which this raises, um, is there a dilemma for scientists in working for government money? Well, I think as someone actually said, you know, what is the actual reality for most scientists working in the university like myself? I mean, I'm a professor at Oxford University. I teach medicine, but I run a small research lab. Um, I apply for funding from the Medical Research Council, the Biotechnology Council. I don't get my money straight from the drug companies. It's nothing like that. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be about scientific investigation. I think the problem is, two major problems. It's hard and harder to get funding. Um, because of the cuts, austerity, the rest of it. Secondly, you force more and more to think about short-term goals. So, you know, it's just got an immediate medical benefit. That, the problem is, if you think in that kind of way, some of the major discoveries, uh, the discovery of the DNA double helix, um, superconductors, uh, the genome editing, these were all things that were discovered by curiosity-driven science. They weren't thinking about the possibilities in terms of medicine. Um, so I think we really have to cut against that kind of culture. So part of the building the scientific left is not just about fighting for our you know, conditions at work and the rest of it, fighting against casualisation, I'll come back to that point a little later, but also fighting for proper funding for science. Yeah, so it should be funding, you know, space probes to, to Mars, but we should be funding medical research instead of the military. It's amazing that over 50% of our research, you know, goes to fund the military. Um, I do think we have to defend scientists, uh, science. I mean, as I'm a scientist, so I'd be worried if the SPP wasn't defending science. But I think it's because science is revolutionary. You know, this, this process of understanding more about how the world works does undermine uh, established ideas. It does undermine, ultimately, capitalism, I think, because... Um, the Genome Project is a good example. The Genome Project, the ideology that sold the Genome Project, was very much this idea that you, know, you can reduce everything down to genes, uh, that we'll soon know ourselves, we'll be able to solve homelessness and schizophrenia and all blah, 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 you know, by, by understanding the genome. Actually, what's been really interesting about the Genome Project, also the, the follow-on products like the ENCODE product that looked at how the genome actually works, is that it's undermined this idea that there's a simple link between genes and behavior, a simple link between genes and disease. In ways, I think, takes us close to the reality. It's not an easy reality. It's not like we're going to have a wonder drug for, you know, schizophrenia in, in the future. But it does actually give us a more rich and more complex a more uh, true view of how the world actually works. And in that sense, that's the revolutionary side of, uh, of science. The problem is, is that under capitalism, doing that kind of path-break pioneering research is, is, you know, is, is increasingly difficult. Um, I think we have lots to say in building a scientific left to the people who work in science because 
you know, sometimes you get a view. I mean, I've heard this from Stephen Rose that, in, by, you know, to some extent, science has been bought off by the system. That's not the way I see it from looking around at my fellow scientists. I see people who are struggling for research funds, um, casualisation of, of the whole workforce. You know, I think only, the university are only second to, to the catering industry in terms of you know, zero hours contracts. Even if you're a permanent member of staff like myself, you know, you want a pay freeze. Thick, thick, it's, I'm not saying it's, it's you know, it's, uh, we, we don't have our perks at Oxford and the rest of it. We have our you know, dinners and things. But you know, at the end of the day, it's, 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 you know, we, we, we are struggling to, to, to do the, the work we really want to do that, that led us into science, and that's the key thing. But also, there are a lot of people who work in science, EU nationals, who are now threatened you know, by being deported, the rest of it, who we, I think we can also appeal to. I don't think it's a surprise that many people who work in science uh, are worried about Brexit because, because they're from the EU. You know, my wife is Portuguese. Uh, it's quite common for people to, to travel to other countries to work as postdocs. And I think we can really appeal to those people, not just in fighting for, 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 again, against casualisation, but also in defending the right to stay of EU nationals. And I think it's a very pertinent kind of issue in the universities. Um, try and finish the rest. Uh, in research funding, I think I've dealt with all about the, the medical of the military that's been done. Uh, increase in privatisation for science funding. I think the biggest problem is there's just less and less funding for all stop, you know. And, uh, this idea that kind of drug companies are, you know, dominate our research. The problem is it's just hard to get funds for stop. So we should reject this idea about the short term. We should be thinking of the bigger picture. And I think really to sort of finish now, um, how we kind of change society, how we link that to a fight for science that can be really used to, to help people and not just a few. Um, we, 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 we reject the idea that you know, science should be funded on by philanthropists. I mean, it's great in a way that Bill Gates is putting money into, you know, trying to combat AIDS and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, why should it be left to sort of private donations by, by, by individuals? We should be fighting for public funds, for science. Um, we should be, I think also, though, trying to, when we talk to scientists, uh, uh, we should also be pointing out the value of the Marxist method for understanding society as a whole. One thing that really drew me to the SPP, I mean, I, I think it was 30 years ago th this, this year that I joined the SPP as a PhD student, and one of the things that really appealed to me as a scientist was seeing the Marxist view which could be used to explain society as a whole in a scientific <coughs> manner, because in a way that's, that's essentially what we're doing, isn't it? When we look at the economy and we, we, you know, we go beyond the kind of pseudoscience that you get in mainstream economics, that is really a, the scientific method. That's what pulled me towards the, uh, the, the Socialist Worker Party. But I think the other thing is that we realise that the, 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 the site we live in, you know, as I said earlier on, you can sequence a baby's genome in 50 hours now. That's an amazing thing. It could be used to really help people if it's applied in the right way. Um, but look at the state of the world. It's not just the children starving to death in Africa. It's the fact that the whole planet is threatened by climate change. Actually, the, 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 the scientific tools to stop that are all available. It's all quite clear what to do. It's quite clear how to stop antibiotic resistance. All these things could be solved scientifically. The political way is the thing that's missing. And so I think if we really want to appeal to people who work in science but also outside science and more generally in society, it's saying that we need to pose a completely different way of doing things. If you really want to harness the amazing technology that's developed under capitalism, uh, we need to do something really quickly because otherwise we're going to have no civilization, you know, no technology left at all. And that's, I think, where the Russian Revolution uh, shows the potential because it showed that even in a, you know, in a backward country 100 years ago, amazing things were possible, amazing things were done before Stalin came to power, smashed the whole thing. And we, we could do, you know, 10 times, 100 times that now with the technology that we've got. Um, you know, uh, maybe even a socialist solar system. That, that's where we could be aiming towards. But we've got to start with the here and now, and the here and now is building a movement, you know, that will unite um, scientists, workers across the, the, the economic sphere uh, in, in, in a movement to, to really uh, develop a society that's run for need, not profit.